discourse is very much about Islamicization uh, as taking over Europe uh, and uh, refers to this uh, 1895 painting uh, Peoples by Hermann Nachfuss, Peoples of Europe, Peoples of Europe, Guard Your Most Sacred Possession. And here you see the representatives of uh, different uh, Western nations, Britannia and Germany and so on, and then uh, in the distance, the menacing figure of the Buddha because we know what the Buddha uh, would do to Europe, right? And this kind of s uh, storm that would be threatening uh, the West. And Bismarck had in mind uh, Japan, although this was certainly applied to China. And the idea of the Yellow Peril uh, persisted and manifested itself in popular culture, most famously, uh, for example, in the figure of Fu Manchu, uh, the insidious Fu Manchu, Dr. Fu Manchu, by Sax Roma, this kind of crazed British writer who wrote a series of fairly unreadable novels between 1912 and 1959, made into a whole series of uh, films, and whose figures are found all over popular culture, of a kind of mad uh, oriental genius who combines Asian mysticism and a kind of Asian magic with Western science. So there's this deep-rooted fear of uh, this uh, Asian uh, yellow peril who will use Western science against the West. And of course, Sax Roma also had in mind uh, the Chinese immigration uh, to Britain where he lived, uh, as well as uh, in um, in North America as also the kind of wave of uh, the yellow hordes. Uh, but we see this kind of notion of the yellow peril present today. Um, so this is actually already a decade old, how we would fight China, but this is something that's still uh, being uh, discussed. There's a sort of, um, what are we gonna do with the Pacific power in Asia? But also uh, in terms of economic war, here you see a cartoon with a, a great wall made up of boxes of things made in China. Right, so China is this manufacturing giant which threatens to overwhelm the West. So this notion of the yellow peril is uh, by far, uh, is by no means uh, dead. Okay, uh, and some have identified certain uh, products of Western popular culture like uh, Blade Runner uh, where uh, you have often kind of Asiatic images in this uh, you know, future with uh, replicants and uh, a totally artificial packaged life. So a kind of exoticism of the East that is connected to this discourse around technology. And there's been some uh, work about techno-orientalism and Blade Runner. But I won't go any further about Blade Runner. Okay, so what I want to do in this uh, talk is to contextualize and in many ways question uh, these orientalist slash techno-orientalist uh, discourses of uh, East Asian automatons and robots. Now, my work has tried to show that this, these are by no means the only ways in which particularly Westerners have perceived uh, Asia and East Asia in particular, but they are dominant in many ways. Uh, so I'm going to turn first to early modern European conceptions of the Asian automaton. So I'm going to look at some early modern thinkers and the ways in which they have depicted Chinese and Japanese to some extent uh, as soulless automatons in a perhaps post-Cartesian context, uh, which may connect very much to a sort of traditional orientalist view of uh, Asia as backwards. Uh, and then I'll look at what's happening on the other side, what is happening in Asia, and particularly in Japan, Japan's encounters with the West in the early modern period, um, and uh, the early Japanese automatons, and where they arise, the particular context in which they arise, the, the particular influences which flow back and forth between the West and Japan. Then I'll look at robots in Japanese culture before the Second World War, some of the anxieties about robots in light of Carol Chopek's uh, Rossum's Universal Robots, for example, and the ways in which then robot is taken up in fascist and militarist Japan, uh, as well as in Japanese eugenics. I'll briefly mention that. And then turn to robots in post-war and contemporary Japanese popular culture, selecting a few examples of some of the complex ways in which 
the Japanese have depicted automatons and robots, such that we can't make any broad generalizations with uh, precision about you know, the Asian view of robots versus the Western view of robots. Okay, so ter first turning to early modern Asian automatons, or a kind of automaton figures. This may seem indulgent because I'm uh, um, in the early modern studies program, and it probably is. But uh, uh, it's interesting that the, when the West first encounters East Asia, um, in the form of, in a kind of sustained engagement with uh, East Asian culture, we have the Jesuit missionaries in the 16th century who uh, admired Chinese culture in many ways and uh, in strong contrast to their encounter in the uh, Americas. So Chinese society and government was upheld by the Jesuits as deeply admirable, uh, perhaps a model for Europe, but certainly ripe for conversion to Christianity. And interestingly, from the get-go, the Jesuit encounter with China and with East Asia is very much dependent on technology. And in particular, the Jesuits, any success they achieve in uh, China and Japan, and in some ways it was quite limited, came about because of their linguistic ability, so people like Matteo Ricci, mastering Chinese to an impressive degree, but also the stuff they brought with them, right? the maps, uh, the clocks, the prisms, um, some of the paintings, uh, and so on. These kind of curios that fascinated some of the people in China. And they would say, okay, yeah, you've come here to preach some kind of strange religion, but you've got some really interesting clocks here. Let's have a look at that. Now, interestingly, this encounter shows various evaluations by the Jesuits of Asian culture. The Jesuits would often underscore the way in which Chinese mathematics and astronomy was quite inferior, despite the fact that, for example, Matteo Ricci was teaching the Ptolemaic system to the Chinese. So uh, one might question uh, that attitude of superiority there. Still, the Jesuits, uh, with their astronomical knowledge, managed to plant themselves within China in the Imperial uh, Astronomical Bureau, would modernize it in some way. So Ferdinand Verbiest, an important figure in this regard, even coming up with a blueprint from a, for a steam automobile uh, that uh, was never, uh, never, came to, never came to light. So while the Jesuits admired Chinese morality, Chinese ethics and politics, they still maintain that Chinese science was rather backwards and Chinese technology was uh, undeveloped. So they tended to, for example, criticize the way in which astronomy was always connected to the imperial cosmology. Like the, the movement of the heavens was connected to the success uh, or failures of Chinese dynasties. And this would be followed by other Europeans who would often depend on Jesuit accounts for their of views on Asia and on China. And so subsequent Europeans would tend to agree with the Jesuits that the Chinese were inferior scientifically and technologically to Europe. And then they would go even further. And unlike the Jesuits would say, well, their moral, apparent moral superiority is actually a sign of their servitude. So Leibniz, one of the, probably the most philosophically sophisticated um, philosopher to think about, well, sorry, the philosophically sophisticated um, interlocutor with China and Chinese thought argued, for example, in his Novisma Sinica of 1697 to 99 news from China based on his reading of the Jesuit accounts, so great is obedience towards superiors and reverence towards elders, so religious almost is the relation of children towards parents that for children to contrive anything violent against their parents even by word is almost unheard of. So he saw, he had deeply admired Confucianism as a seemingly uh, exalted moral system which maintained social and political harmony, such that I think one could argue he even saw the Chinese as sort of ethical 
automatons. So he talks about how there is a marvelous respect and an established order of duties. To us, not enough accustomed to act by reason and rule, the smack of servitude. Scarcely anyone offends another by the smallest word in common conversation. And they rarely show evidences of hatred, wrath, or excitement. Neighbors and even members of a family are so held back by a hedge of custom that they are able to maintain a kind of perpetual courtesy. So the, Conf the Confucian programming of the Chinese seems so strong uh, that uh, to Leibniz's eyes, not having actually gone there, uh, he can't perceive any uh, deviance, deviation from Confucian moralism. Now it's interesting that, and some people have attributed to Leibniz the view that the Chinese are spiritual automatons. But interestingly, Leibniz does mention automatons in relation to his monadological system in his philosophy, where he argues that the body uh, is a natural automaton, that it's a machine that contains within it monads, uh, and then uh, within it all the way down uh, God's divine machine. And in a way, though Leibniz may see the Chinese as automatons, he basically sees all of us as spiritual automatons, and that automatons are never separate from spirit. That there's always a way in which body and soul are in uh, this kind of dynamic uh, uh, interaction, or harmony, I should say, that would be uh, more correct. But indeed, he did seem to kind of regard Confucianism in particular as providing for this vast harmony and perhaps uh, analogous to the idea of a kind of automaton. Later thinkers take a much more negative view of the Chinese in particular. So Montesquieu, the French philosopher, French political thinker uh, in the mid-18th century, wrote The Spirit of the Laws argues that the Confucian rites are nothing more than external rules rather than applying to uh, intrinsic uh, moral obligation. And so he says, uh, as the precepts of rites are in no way spiritual but are simply rules of common practice, it is easier to convince and to stamp spirits with them than with something intellectual. So he thought, reacting to the Jesuits and people like Leibniz, that the Chinese uh, were merely kind of physical machines who could only respond to corporeal punishment. And indeed, he seemed to regard uh, different peoples as, particularly in Asia, particularly outside of Europe, uh, as lacking a certain uh, spirit or soul. Uh, so he regards the Asian body as an automaton, as we see in one of his remarks um, in Mes Pensées, My Thoughts, uh, where he writes, it could be that the constancy of the Japanese during torture might be due to the fact that physical suffering is perhaps not so great there, that the bodily machine is not so susceptible to pain there. So he seemed to regard Asians as well as Africans and the peoples of the Americas, most people outside Europe, as susceptible to uh, external, uh, external uh, environment and conditions which then kind of weakens their sense of agency and individuality. So all these despotic countries which uh, have a hot climate, or really cold climate, but usually hot, um, are ones in which the peoples are um, servile and unchanging. And so he writes in the Spirit of the Laws again, if you join the weakness of organs that makes the peoples of the East receive the strongest impressions in the world to a certain laziness of the spirit, naturally bound with that of the body, which makes the spirit incapable of any action, any effort, any application, you will understand that the soul can no longer alter impressions once it has received them. That is why laws, mores, and manners, even those that seem not to matter like the fashion and clothing, remain in the East today as they were a thousand years ago. So there may even be a kind of environmental slash physiological, I mean, the, the, the cause and effect is always a bit confused in Montesquieu, but environmental physiological reason for the uh, constancy of Asian con cultures and a sort of civility uh, of the Asian. And later Enlightenment thinkers like Johann Gottfried Herder would further locate this in particular physiology, 
So, for example, Herder would say that the Chinese have a certain mechanical ingenuity, but that's it. Uh, nature, so he talks about how nature provides different peoples around the world, uh, different sorts of attributes. Nature seems to have denied to them the Chinese, as well as to several other nations of this corner of the world, the gift of grand and free invention in the sciences. Well, on the other hand, she has bountifully endowed their little eyes with that adroitness, that clever industriousness and refinement, that artistic talent for imitating whatever their cupidity found useful. So they're creatures of desire in East Asia, ones whose physiologies are fit for um, a kind of imitative talent, and that's it. And sometimes you still hear some of these uh, attributes um, projected onto Asians. And of course, uh, um, Gottfried, sorry, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who in many ways criticizes Herder's reliance on physiology and nature, nonetheless argues that the Chinese lack a, an internal subjectivity, an internal subjective freedom. And so he says that in China, the, the universal will, the state as embodied in the emperor, immediately commands what the individual is to do, and the latter complies and obeys with proportionate renunciation of reflection and personal independence. So servile to the emperor. If he does not obey, the punishment he undergoes does not affect his subjective and internal, but simply his outward existence. So, these are just some examples of uh, depictions of Chinese and other Asians as soulless automatons. And I think this image persists, uh, for example, in the media when we uh, hear about the kind of manufacturing um, threat of China, where everyone wears the same pink outfits or something like that and behave the same on the assembly lines or uh, kind of a soulless anonymous computer programmers who are trying to hack into our systems. So the reality behind this projection onto East Asia is much more complex and so I'll get into uh, that, some of aspects of that history, particularly focusing on Japan's encounter with the West, and particularly early Japanese automatons. So the Japanese encountered uh, Europe around the same time as the Chinese with Jesuit missionaries, um, uh, Portuguese who arrived there with muskets, which then the Japanese actually started making themselves and improving. Uh, so they were quite interested in aspects of European technology or uh, ways of making firearms, although there were obviously firearms in Asia as well. But in the Edo period, between 1640 and 1853 in particular, the country closed itself off to the West in large part, except for the Dutch. And the Dutch had a trading interest and the Dutch were willing to trade with the Japanese and not try to convert them. And so their knowledge of the West came through the Dutch, known as uh, Rangaku, uh, from Orand, which means Holland, Holland learning, particularly medicine and astronomy. Uh, and one of the uh, striking encounters that happens here is, is a uh, uh, physician named Sugita Genpaku, who has this criminal named Oacha Baba, or Green Tea Hag, uh, has her um, body opened up, she's been executed, and uh, recognizes in that body organs that correspond more to a Dutch anatomy textbook that he's brought with him rather than the, the books of Chinese medicine that he had been trained in. And so he embarked on a translation project of the Dutch anatomy book on late Kundiger Tafelen, and this became the Kai Tai Shinsho, a new book of anatomy based on this Dutch anatomical text. Now I mentioned this episode in the Dutch encounter um, because as you can see from these images, I mean the images are taken from the Dutch anatomical text, uh, simplified in many ways, the notes were taken away, also the figures are rendered as Japanese rather than as European, but this also marks a, a fascination with anatomical description. It wasn't considered integral to medicine prior to people like uh, Sugita Genpaku. Uh, 
where Chinese medicine, for example, was based on invisible qi flows rather than on uh, necessarily the uh, constitution of organs. That was less important than uh, understanding the processes, a different way of thinking about the body. So prior to this, for a couple of centuries, then the, the well, the previous century, the Japanese had already been using uh, various automata known as karakuri or mechanisms. And these would be used in religious festivals, in plays, and at home. Uh, they were, the, the term was used for puppets in which there would be mechanisms such that uh, they could perform various tricks like doing handstands or climbing a ladder or whatever at a particular festival for a particular purpose. And some have argued that uh, there may have been a kind of indirect influence of Dutch learning on the further development of the karakuri. But it's important to note that these karakuri, these mechanisms, these automata were already present in Japan uh, prior to, for example, Genpaku's uh, uh, translation project. And so a year after Kaitai Shinsho was published, um, uh, the first, perhaps the first Japanese automaton proper was created, a sake cup-carrying uh, doll. Uh, and this sparked some other kind of similar versions, uh, such as a tea-carrying doll. And I'll just show you a kind of quick video. Okay, so uh, this, the person on the left has uh, kind of wound up the mechanism. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the doll, well, it's not very clear here, but it kind of walks with respectful steps. Uh, then you take your cup, drink the tea, or sake in the case of the sake cup. Place it back, and then through various springs, it then goes back. Isn't that great? Okay. Uh, and there were various other automata uh, that appear in this period. So there's a, uh, a snake charmer for example, uh, so uh, there's basically a kind of mechanical snake that, uh, and it's, it's a rather erotic one, and it goes between the breasts of the snake charmer, and then she feels ecstasy. Anyway, I won't get into it. Uh, and then there's also one where, uh, and there are versions of this, where a child or an archer is drawing a bow and tries to shoot a target, and when he misses, the, the head goes down. So all done uh, automatically. So these all seem to be, and they were in large part, kind of Edo court entertainments in Japan. But maybe there was something more to it. And after all, they were important enough to uh, merit uh, this work, the Karakuri Zui, which was a sort of manual or encyclopedia of Karakuri by Hosokawa Hanzo Yorinaro in 1796. On the left-hand side, you can see the original uh, Japanese uh, showing the uh, uh, sake carrying doll and then the mechanism uh, that uh, is used, uh, the internal mechanism of the automaton and then a, a sort of uh, English translation here which is a bit uh, blurry. Uh, and, and you know it shows the various ways in which uh, pulleys and strings are used uh, so that the, uh, the, the doll or the, the puppet if you like uh, engages in this automatic movement. So Hanzo wrote this work, uh, was an engineer, he was also an astronomer, um, you know, learned in a number of sciences, and wrote this compendium where he mentions how things like magnetism and gravity uh, and various materials with their elastic properties are used in order to create these automata. And this is, reminds us, for those of you who went to Courtney Ann Roby's lecture, you know, Hero of Alexandria's, uh, treatise, and they have, of course, been recreated. And you have other great karakuri creators, such as uh, Hisashige Tanaka, who invented uh, an archer doll where the, the doll shoots uh, the arrow, uh, as well as many other inventions. He invented a clock that you only needed to wind up once a year, the myriad year clock, a lamp that 
almost never failed. Um, and he, uh, late, he had this company that built telegraphs uh, as well as early telephones. So as one scholar argues, uh, Miri Nakamura, many of these inventors were scientists in their own right, she argues, as some built agricultural machines and others created cameras, medicines, and even fireworks. These Japanese automata that were considered to be scientific projects, not merely curios. And it is this aspect that ties them to their European counterparts. So the creation of these karakuri happened at the same time as other inventions and were part of uh, general projects of uh, creating new inventions, not simply as curios, but perhaps uh, investigating how materials work, how to create um, uh, artificial, uh, various artificial devices. Now I should mention that the reason why these karakuri might have been very much to ties. So after nine hours, and the, the amazing thing is here. Look, and you probably remember the previous examples. No examples, no representation. You know, the thing basically trains itself. So this starts to be a little bit scary because, you know, you turn it on and you never know what's going to come out. The technology underneath is called generative adversarial networks. It's essentially uh, a set of algorithms that look at very few examples given and produce a mass of examples that are like those but different. Very interesting. So this is, uh, this is this new thing. Uh, and I think it's a breakthrough because for the first time, we basically remove the human from that machine learning loop. No need for a human to build a representation. No need for a human to label the examples. Of course, there was a lot of super uh, expert human labor in building that system, and it's not clear how far it generalizes. For instance, um, I think that uh, they published a version of the system for Go a year ago. So it took them a year to take it from Go to chess. So, and these are super experts. So, you know, it's not a trivial thing to do, but still very impressive. Okay, so what is new? So we have an AI spring in a sense that uh, we had an AI winter where things were not so good in AI. Uh, MIT was talking about actually removing the neural network course from its curriculum seriously. Somehow they haven't done that. They're very happy to talk about it. If they did remove it, they wouldn't. Uh, so now, of course, everybody's interested. Uh, you go to these conferences, neural network conferences, the last one, I think had 6,000 people attending. Uh, uh, people that come out uh, uh, with degrees in this uh, basically write their own paychecks. Um, so, uh, so what is new? Because we had these situations where AI was, wow, you know, now we can solve everything and there were promises made and these promises weren't kept and then People became skeptical and then it came to an AI winter. So that turned around. What is different this time? I think there are two different things. First of all, there is incredible problem, progress in the perceptual problem. There is perceptual problem that is taking data given in forms of images or language. And so, so far until now, we still needed a human to kind of enter this into the computer. And now for the first time, we can give it raw data as is images, sound, words, text, and it will be uh, understood. So that perceptual problem for the first time seems to have been solved. And the second, which I don't see many people talking about, it's very interesting, is something that I call democratization of AI research. So it used to be that 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, to do advanced research at this level, you needed to be at a university with an excellent library, a huge computer, a very expensive software. Now the library is on the internet. The computer you rent from Amazon if you, for $30 a month to do very significant computation. And the software is open and for free. So as a result of that, all over the world you have young people who are not necessarily at Harvard, MIT, or Cambridge, who produce excellent work because it's possible. And that, I think, contributes to the progress of the field at the technical level. Why that only happened that sort of deep learning around 2010? First of all, because somebody proposed that this technology called GPUs will be useful. So GPUs, very briefly, uh, that stands for graphical processing units. 
is a, a device that were invented not at all for AR, for game playing stations. And they do a lot of very small, very low level detailed computation very fast in parallel. And they're very inexpensive. A good one costs about $1,000. So they were built for games, but then somebody noticed that they can be used to do this advanced learning. And for instance, the ImageNet, that's why they were able to compute these 60 million parameters in a space of hours, because they used a number of these GPUs. But you know, it, uh, probably the GPUs they used, they all cost under $10,000. So it's not a barrier to entry for anyone. But that technology was brought into AI. And that technology, of course, only happened around that time. Then there is the cloud. So this is sort of availability of uh, uh, incredibly powerful computing systems for very little money that you don't need to own. It's a service. You go, you rent it like electricity. Then you forget about it. Amazon, Google, Microsoft uh, have one. Compute Canada uh, has a very nice one for uh, researchers in Canada. And the third uh, uh, factor, in my opinion, is that uh, this whole open source movement that by 2010 started producing very, very high quality software, probably much better than commercial versions and for free. So, you know, you add all these things together, it's a bit like my democratization, and then you see why when these things actually all met around 2010, they were able to get those results. Okay, so some predictions very quickly. Uh, so I, I go on a limb and I'd be very happy to discuss that. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, there will be a job elimination. And while so far it's been, let's say, limited or mainly uh, existing in uh, low collar jobs like driving, for instance, will most likely be eliminated in 10 years or so, excuse me. And there are hundreds of thousands of people. There are 14 states in the US where driving is the number one occupation. And the government does nothing to prepare these people for their loss of job. That's going to happen. It's not necessarily negative <coughs> because one thing that will bring is many, many fewer uh, accidents. Because a lot of tons of accidents, probably the majority, is due to human error. So there will be fewer accidents there will be fewer jobs. But my point is that this will go into white collar jobs as well. Even to the extent of, you know, some people predicting that uh, the legal profession in certain non-trivial areas like interviewing a witness will be doable by computer better than a human. <coughs> there will be a functioning brain computer interface. Because if you think about it, the oldest part of the computing system is the input. The mouse has been invented 50 years ago. The keyboard has been invented probably 150 years ago. We still use those to communicate with the computer. But these neuroscientists now, they I think are close to come up with some system of like EEG, but only a few electrodes put on the, on the head, or eventually outside, and you will just be uh, talking to your computer by thinking. And that's interesting, it's also a bit uh, <coughs> scary, because uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, concept of lying, for instance, will be basically under attack, right? So, you know, lying, okay, anyways, that's not for me to think about this. Uh, one thing that I think will happen, and it's not necessarily nice, uh, so where is money, right? Porn, and particularly these haptic technologies where you will have the feeling of actually touching something, that will go into porn big time. There's tons of money there, and then when there is money, there will be progress. And people will be working on that. There will be billions of dollars in a huge market. I think that's going to happen. Very tough moral problems. I'm not going to go into that with anybody. But I think that will be, there will be new kinds of jobs as well. We talked about it at Acadia. Because, um, and we can't even tell what they are. And I, I tell you why. Because 30 years ago, if I told you that there would be hundreds of thousands of people that do web design, I couldn't even say that because there was no web. Right? So this is what I have in mind. There will be jobs that we cannot even imagine that these technologies will bring about. And that's usually how it's been with technologies. I mean, you know, we had thousands of people that used to, uh, uh, to carry you know, heavy materials and so on. And that's gone now, right? So I mean, they've been replaced by technology. People do something else. I don't know how it will happen, but there is this very interesting cycle 
that was uh, uh, sort of put forward by my colleague, uh, Masam Tare, at the uh, New York University School of Business. So, so he says, well, what happens is that the new technologies, because they lower prices, they stimulate demand, and, uh, uh, and then also cause an increase in not automatable labor in the low part of the value chain. A very good example is e-commerce. E-commerce resulted in a, a growth of jobs in delivery because before Amazon drones come into production, you know, somebody has to drive these trucks and deliver these packages. So there's many more people doing that today than 10 years ago. But these are low-end jobs. That's what the point is. And then they are vulnerable to automation because people are working on eliminating these deliveries and doing it uh, with drones and other systems. So that will then may decrease the human labor. So this is a cycle that uh, we have to think about. Um, and the automation will come in these situations where we cannot have a human in the loop because the, the speed of the system is too high and the cost of a single mistake is small. So we have financial transactions as an example, right? I mean, there's so many of them that they can't be by, done by humans anymore. And if one transaction in a, a, a million, there's a mistake, the bank will fix this. It's part of their cost. So this will get automated, not at all. What are the challenges? And we'll spend more time on that, uh, I'm sure. Uh, so the technical challenges are this interpretability, and uh, sort of this means merging the classical symbolic AI with these new deep methods. And there's a very interesting movement that many of you may have heard about uh, that's called algorithmic fairness. Essentially looking at algorithms that uh, in a way, maybe not intended, but in a way uh, stigmatize a certain part of the population without any good reason to do that. And there are these uh, well-known situations about you know, systems that use machine learning to predict uh, uh, whether an offender will be offend and the kinds of problems that uh, the, the data introduced. And we need to work on that more. There is a very interesting research done by Cynthia work at Harvard just to refer to this. And one of the big challenges is this. Can AI harm humans? And you know, I used to be sure that it's not the case because we can only unplug the system. But these GANs, these generative uh, networks, made me a little more skeptical. So people are talking about these uh, lethal autonomous weapons, laws. But here's a picture of one. This is very scary, right? Because essentially these are intelligent automatic soldiers, and automatic in a sense that they will be making life and death decisions internally without any connection. Of course, the US DOD, the Department of Defense, ensures, assures you today that that's not going to be the case, but I don't really believe this. So, so yes, this is coming. Who will write the rules for these systems? Right? And, uh, and what if they kind of revolt at some point? I, I don't have answers to this. My only answer is kind of generic and very general, that uh, we, the only way we will get there is education and research. And particularly, I think more of us have to look at ethics of all that and work with philosophers and social scientists and uh, maybe even theologians to come up with something. Thank you very much. I'm happy to do the questions.